All right, we're on and live. So let me get us started recording, and we'll get then into our our lesson for today. This is a backup recording, and I think I was supposed to have done something with some of those backups, but I haven't, so I'll have to be reminded of that again. All right, so we are in First Peter. Or chapter two, we've made chapter two now finally. And last week we ended First uh, Peter chapter one with a sincere and fervent uh, call to love the brethren who make up the community of the faith. So a very fervent call to uh, sincere and fervent love for the brethren who make up the community of faith. And so just a quote from Edmund Clowney in his commentary, the message of First Peter. Peter requires love for fellow Christians as the great mark of true holiness. He's not satisfied with tolerance or acceptance, far less with formalized distance. He will have love, sincere love, without pretense or hypocrisy. The deep, heartfelt love that Peter urges is in no way artificial. It is the brotherly love that unites the family of God. Uh, I thought very, very intense uh, description of what love really should be like, uh, even as brief as it is. It's a very serious and needed aspect of what it means to be a true believer of Yeshua the Messiah. Because uh, Yeshua is trying to build a community of faith. And our problem in America is the uh, idea of we, we have an issue in America with tolerance or intolerance. And we also have an issue in America with individuality to the point that the idea of community is non essential to us in the United States of America. And it's been going that way since the early 1900s, quite literally, with the uh, rise of fundamentalism. But that's not the subject for today, and y'all probably don't want to get into that kind of study. But nonetheless, that is a reality of the rise of fundamentalism. And this is directed primarily at believers. The presence of these attitudes and actions are prevalent in a society at large that creates division and enmity. And so we need to be cognizant of that in general, and we have that uh, at work. One of our greatest examples of this kind of love that uh, Clowney was describing is Moses, Moshe, who continued to love and pray for Israel in spite of their constant complaining and arguing. They were always given God grief and given Moses grief, and they, they were argumentative. They were uh, frustrating. They stopping and not doing and going, and they were constantly criticizing Moses and wanting to quit, go back home to Egypt and yet he kept on praying for them and trying to create this idea of following after God. And so we begin this week's portion with a desire for the pure milk of the word, which requires putting aside those things that divide us. And a lot of it's that idea of tolerance versus intolerance that we mentioned a minute ago and directed primarily at believers in this case. But these attitudes and actions are prevalent in the society at large. And we know that. And it creeps into the community of faith so often. Quite true in today's world. The true disciple of that and I should put aside these things. What things? Well, let's read our text and we'll see what he's talking about. Therefore, uh, putting aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. If you've tasted of the kindness of Adonai. So we find five words describing this divisiveness and enmity of the past regarding both Jews and Gentiles. Today, like way back then, uh, that should be our past life, not our present life. But there's a tremendous need to bind us all together and family love one for another. And we can't do that if we hadn't put aside some of these things that uh, Peter is talking to us about. The love that binds together, the redeemed flows out, first of all, of our love for the Redeemer. If we truly love the Lord, then we should love everybody who is Adonai's children, all the Lord's people. And so the love that binds together flows out of this love for our Redeemer. For such love to appear, our pride or alienation from God and from one another has to be swept away. And so our pride and alienation from God and from one another has to be swept away. And in the little letters of 1 John, he says, you can't say you love God and hate your brother at the same time. It doesn't fit. It doesn't belong. And you can't say that you love God and, and treat your brother badly. It doesn't fit. It's not right. But uh, in any case, you understand uh, the point as what Peter is talking about here. There's only 
one way for sweeping away all of these things, these five words we're going to take a look at. And that is uh, for the word of God, the instrument by which the Rach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, gives us new birth in Messiah Yeshua. And also uh, that same word that will nourish us to grow us into the love of Yeshua and into a spiritual maturity. So we have to have the word of God and the Holy Spirit at work together in us, in our minds, in our hearts, in our souls to get us there. We can't get there without the spirit and we can't get there without the word of God. It's not something we can muster up within our desires. It takes a change, a transformation of what we desire and how we think and how we live our lives. And so this scripture says uh, we put aside all these things and we long for desire the pure milk of the word and this is how we are to grow then in respect to salvation our text literally opens with putting aside therefore uh, it lists these five things these are sins that from which we've been saved and should now be separated it reflects the fallen state of the world around us from which we've been transformed uh, these are things that somehow sometimes remain in the life of of unbelief when it comes to our interpersonal relationships and to that which prevents our going into a spiritual maturity and a unity in the community uh, because these things still are prevalent with us and so let's look at these words number one was all malice uh, actually a catch word uh, kakos in, in greek which means wickedness depraved thoughts desires maliciousness and a mean spirit you mean to tell me there's mean-spirited Christians? Absolutely, I've known a few of them. Uh, mean-spirited people, dominating type of people. It characterizes those entrenched in the world system and exhibit its maliciousness towards those not just exactly like they are. And so in other words, if you don't believe exactly like I am, I can't be your friend, I can't be your neighbor, I can't be your comrade, I can't be your, um, in your worship service. And so it characterizes those entrenched in this idea of this rugged individualism of America. And there's a maliciousness that you have to be exactly what I think you ought to be. It's unfortunate in today's world, or in today's world, it should be instead of word, it doesn't matter if you're on the far left or far right. On the far left, you believe exactly like they do, or they want to rid the country of you. On the far right, they, if you don't live and believe exactly what they do. They don't want to listen to you. They, you don't have the right to voice your opinion. They have the right to voice theirs alone. And we have it on both ends of this scale, far left to far right, and neither one accepts anybody except those exactly like themselves. And it's tearing us apart is on the right side in, uh, in the world of those who believe, really. And so malice, we need to get rid of this. And so it's a kind of uh, demand of some kind of a uniformity that eliminates a unity in diversity. And we we'll only have to go to, to two books, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, to understand that God intended a diverse group of people. Diversity is full of color. It's full of life. It's full of vigor. Because if you lived in John's world, it would be pretty dull. And we need other people to make life meaningful. And God intended to have a unity even within diversity. And we're not supposed to get mad and say, I'm not playing with you anymore. Pick up our marbles and go home. We're supposed to stay together and work out the details of what it means to be together in one body. So all malice, all deceit uh, means a cunning and treachery that goes beyond merely lying to someone's face. It means taking advantage of others through craftiness and underhanded methods. It can include hiding the truth in order to achieve one's desires. As well as professing the truth, um, it can mean hiding the truth. So deceitfulness. The third word is the word hypocrisy. Uh, it's to present a public impression of yourself that is at odds with who you really are. Uh, to appear one way before others and to live a different way when you're apart from them. Uh, to be at odds with your real purpose or intent. Pretending to be righteous when in fact you're not righteous at all. Uh, to talk or present yourself before others in one way and to act differently uh, around others who are just like you really are and you're at home with them. Uh, the fourth word is the word envy. The word envy, sometimes it's described as a jealousy in the worst sense of the word. But it, it means uh, basically to refer to a disdain or a little hate because of someone's success or popularity. When you don't have that 
yourself. So um, I, I don't want you to be popular if I can't be popular. Uh, this idea of envy. Or some people that say, uh, I'm envious. I want what you've got. I want that popularity. I want that new Lamborghini. I want that big old mansion. I want that enormous houseboat. Whatever it is, it's the idea of the envy. And then number five is slander. The Greek term actually means evil speech or to speak against someone. Most likely this to the Hebrew concept of Lashon Hara, evil speech or gossip. Uh, often construed to mean gossip or character assassination. And it's to tear down another's reputation, most often in order to build you up yourself. And unfortunately, this is one of the most popular practices in this country and in the whole world today, tearing down other people's character just so you can get ahead of them. And that seems to be what happens these days. There's, there's not gaining ground because of your stance for how you're going to function as a senator, as a House of Representatives, or as a president of the United States, it's defaming everybody else's character to make you look better. You know, that's how these battles are fought these days. It's a horrible way to fight these battles. We should be able to fight on the basis of what we're going to actually be like when we get in office. But lies, so much of it, it seems to be because they don't function that way once they get in office. And so we have these five words that we need to apply to our own life. And put aside this kind of mentality. Lashon hara. And so when it comes right down to. Uh, a teaching that's false. We'll deal with the teaching. When it comes down to dealing with. A, an understanding of the Bible. That we don't agree with. We deal with the understanding of the Bible. We should not tear down someone's character. Based on uh, they disagree with me. But rather deal with the issue. And not uh, tear down someone. Because we have a difference of opinion. But that's what so often typically happens in our world so put aside these things and this has parallels in both James and in Paul put away these things that used to characterize us out in the world and still characterizes our world to a large extent in the United States and so in Ephesians 4 verses 20 through 24 Paul says you didn't learn Messiah this way this wasn't the way Messiah lived you didn't learn what it means to be a follower of Messiah in this way Verse 21, if indeed you have heard him and been taught if in him, just as truth is in Messiah and Yeshua, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay off, uh, lay aside, uh, put away the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And so a new creature Created in God. Created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And in James 1.21, James says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. And so how do, how do we do all this? We long for the sincere milk of the word. And the Greek grammar of our present text in First Peter suggests that this was something that was already done, having put off these things where we got saved. The aorist tense suggests something done in the past that has continuing action in the present. So when God saves us, when God does this work in us and we've made new creatures, it's, it's like he sees us at the far end of this thing. It's like choosing a someone you're going to groom and they're going to be uh, best at certain thing that you see in them and you're just grooming them to become and so when God saves us, he sees these things as already being dealt with because of the blood of Messiah. All these sins have been dealt with because of the blood of Messiah. We died to sin. We were alive unto God. And he sees that far end when we're living a life in holiness and purity. And so this is the idea of this text. Having put these things off, we had to decide we want Yeshua instead of that to be saved to start with, in a sense. And there's a sense in which uh, there, we're dead to that. We're dead to that if we live in faith in Messiah. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Um, but it's like Pavlov's dog. Y'all know the story of Pavlov's dog? A uh, dog's been trained, well trained. And so well trained with a leash. We had a, a dog one time that was well trained by a place over in Tampa, Florida. Went over there and to get the, um, the collie that was our 
dog and protected us. He would grab us by the shirt sleeve and pull us back from the road when my brother and I were little. So we would get out in the street, well-trained dog. And my dad said, I want to see one of those dogs. He said, you're petting one. He said, what do you mean I'm petting one? There's a Doberman at the side of the guy. Just sitting there. And he put that leash on. As soon as that leash clicked in that collar, that dog jumped up on all fours, hackles on the back of the neck raised up, ready to kill. Tag dog. Had to have the order, you know. And so uh, Pavlov's dog is that dog that's so well trained that even when you take the leash off and there's no more authority over that dog, he still lives according to the way it was trained. We're trained to live a certain way in this world to have acceptability by those who do not know Messiah. And so often that training keeps coming back. And we tend to go the way of the training rather than the way of the newness that we have in Yeshua. That's the idea of what uh, James and Paul and Peter are talking about here. We need to put off those things and no longer allow them to influence us in our thoughts and in our actions. So it's something that's happened because I put this stuff off in order to be saved and we need to leave it off. And we need to keep on putting off and putting on. Putting off, putting on is the idea. Uh, putting away in order to put on the new. So for Peter, these things are seemingly put in opposition to the love that they are to practice. If you do the one, you're not practicing the love. If you do the love, you're not practicing the other. Uh, opposition. Apposition to one another. They don't fit. So these specific sins... It's put in such a way in the text here in 1 Peter to say that you can't long for the sincere love or of Messiah or the milk of the word if you continue to live like this. If you long for the sincere milk of the word, you're not going to live like that. And so uh, these sins hinder the ability for us to truly love one another. And our love for the word of God and the Holy Spirit taking that word and transforming us means that we're not going to live like that anymore. And so what a beautiful picture, really. And so these specific sins hinder uh, the ability for us to truly love one another. In reality, it's an ongoing proposition for the true child of God and disciple of Messiah. We continue to put our face towards God and away from the things of the world, an ongoing proposition. We continue to grow into this salvation we've begun to experience. And so as Rabbi Ben has often said, and I've used many times myself, and I learned this in seminary, we have been saved from the past penalty of our sins. We are in constant being saved from the present power of sin at work in the world. We shall be saved from the very presence of sin and that kingdom which is to come. And that new Jerusalem, there'll be no sin present. Because if they allowed any sin to be present, it would no longer be holy. But it will be holy in that day. We're to continue then to grow into this salvation which we have begun to experience. There's a real sense in which these things were done away with when we believe, and which I've already, I think, expressed enough. It was a way of life prior to our conversion, and it's easy to slip back into old bad habits, and we need to practice this constant love and moving towards uh, the Word of God. The true source of such love of Messiah comes through the pure miracle of the word. Uh, to grow in this love, to grow in this uh, determination comes through the pure milk of the word. So the sound teaching of the word of God is desired, uh, designed to create a love for Messiah, a love for our fellow man, and a growing understanding and use of the gifts that the Spirit has given us once we've been saved. Now, we have an unusual occurrence in modern congregations, and that is, if anybody's a banker, well, he needs to be our treasurer. If anybody uh, is skilled in a given area, that must be what he's supposed to do in the congregation. But that's not what the Scripture says at all. It says that he gives us gifts of the Spirit to function in the congregation in the gift the Spirit gave us, not the natural bent of the flesh. And just because somebody's a good banker doesn't necessarily make him a good treasurer of a congregation. Quite frankly, um, congregation should have a planned spending plan rather than a planned saving uh, I think it's a horrible idea that a church would one day eventually have to decide what are we going to do with this uh, large sum of money we've been building in this bank account and letting it build and build and build and, and now we're having 
to um, separate. Uh, we, we plan, well, never mind, let me get off that subject. The true source of love comes from the desire for the milk of the word of God. So in light of this concept, growing into this salvation, Peter lifts the thought of becoming like newborn babies, becoming uh, new infants all over again. Uh, after all, we're born again. So if you're born again, born fresh, born anew, then I have to understand, I have to learn to grow in this idea of what it means to be that new creature. And so the Greek term indicates a newborn baby gaining all his nourishment from being nursed. And newborn believers need to be fed milk, which in this case means the most basic truths of the Scripture. In our typical thinking, uh, what we then want to run to is the idea of moving from milk uh, to gruel, from gruel to real food, from real food to meat, and on and, and have a growth in maturity and begin, begins, uh, begin to grow and be strong and virile and power. That's not what Peter does. Peter doesn't go there. Rather, this figure is that of a true and complete nourishment. Milk is life to a newborn baby. And the idea that he's trying to give us here is completeness of the milk of the word for a newborn believer. It's complete. All the nourishment we need comes from this study of the word of God. And so the newborn baby longs and cries uh, when he's hungry and he needs his mama to nurse him or her. And so as newborn believers in Yeshua, there should be that same hunger and thirst and desire for the word of God as a newborn baby cries after his mother. A long desire to feed upon the truth of God's word. And the main point of this metaphor is an ongoing, deep, personal and strong desire for that which causes us to grow in our salvation experience. And that is God's word. The Greek term translated the New American Standard as pure and in the King James Version as sincere is the opposite of the word deceit that we used in the previous verse, beginning of this thing. Uh, no deceit, no deceitfulness. The basic idea is that of sincere or true. So Peter commends the milk. This again from Edward Clowney, uh, the message of 1 Peter. Peter commends a milk product that's free from additives. Uh, it's a shame, isn't it? You know, uh, if you want to eat right, they tell us we need plenty of uh, essentials uh, like uh, very uh, virgin olive oil, E-V-O-O, -O, extra virgin olive oil. And you can go to stores and you can buy olive oil and find out that it's not olive oil. It's been watered down. It's been watered down with uh, cottonseed oil or some other kind of oil. And it's not really olive oil anymore. And so people are watering down things that we should get. When I buy a gallon of milk, I expect it to be all milk. Now, we put additives in it, but most of the time we still get milk. But not always. Some products are watered down. Well, it happened in the ancient world. This is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, says Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity is always vanity, nothing new under the sun. So what Dr. Clowney says is the word of God abides without preservatives. Consumers of the ancient world were well aware that milk or wine could be watered down. And often was, particularly when you're trying to sell it. And you need more money. I've, got, I've only got one gallon of wine. Well, i tell you what. I believe I can make at least two gallons out of that by watering it down. And I get double the money. And same thing with milk. Water it down a little bit. My mother used to do that. I hated that. Powdered milk and mixed with real milk is no milk at all to me. But that's what she would do to extend it. You know, make it last a longer time. And it's, that's why we make meatloaf. Because if you got ground meat, it's only a pound of meat. You fill it with bread, uh, it's now two pounds. And it lasts longer, and more people get fed with that. And so we extend stuff. But in the ancient world, they would do this sort of thing. And when Paul says that he was not a huckster of the word of God, he alludes to the common practice of selling diluted wine. I, I, I don't water down the word. I give you the full word, says uh, Dr. Clowney of the Apostle Paul. So Peter used a word employed by merchants to indicate a pure, unadulterated product. Nothing else but the word of God. Pure milk of the word. I haven't changed it. I haven't watered it down. I had not added to it. I just give you what God says as the idea. So the word of God is absolute truth. and can be fully trusted. There is the thought of the true believer always existing as a child, always desiring that which causes us to grow and to mature. It's not like the human body 
the human body, when we're young, uh, we need a certain amount of food. When we get those growing spurts, we need a little more food. Uh, when we get through those stressful times, we need plenty of support for the stressful times. When we get older, we start eating less. We don't need as much food. We're not as active. We're not doing that sort of thing anymore. And we can get by on less food and uh, sometimes less rest. I hadn't found that yet. But anyway, you know, the idea is that older people, as uh, they get older, don't require as much food as someone that's out there working a hard job or a young person out there playing sports. That's not true in the realm of a believer. We never get to the place we don't need that word. We never get to the place we don't need to keep studying and growing in the likeness of our Messiah. Doesn't matter if we're 80 or 90 or 100. We never should do without this word. And so this unadulterated milk is a natural appropriate symbol for the source of life for a child. And a child of God. The natural and appropriate symbol for the source of life for us is the word of God and the spirit of God. We must never do without this. So the thought of existing in a child in the sense of that strong desire for God and his word and his spirit. Salvation. Well, that's something we already have by faith in Yeshua. And it's also something that is not yet, for we've not been fully made into what we shall be in the time to come. In the meantime, we're in the process of becoming more and more like Yeshua, for he alone is the standard of life for every believer. Now, I pastored in the Baptist world long enough, and I've been in the Messianic world long enough to realize what a lot of people think happens. I, just, I get saved, I get my ticket punched, and when the time comes, he's going to make everything perfect in me. And in between then and now, how I live ain't so important, says a lot of people. That's not what Peter says. Peter says we should go on longing, desiring this sincere milk of the word because it's what turns us into Messiah. The whole point of what are we doing here now can be summed up in Ephesians 5.25. But uh, what I've given you here is Ephesians 4.14-16. through 16. Where he says, as a result, we're to no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every doctrine of doctrine, every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking truth in love. We're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Messiah, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. You know what that really says? That says if every part ain't here, we ain't what we're supposed to be. So the whole body being fit and held, held together. What fits us and holds us together is all of us pulling together that makes up this body of believers being here, worshiping here, loving here, relating here, held by whatever joint supplies according to the proper working of each part. So if one part's missing, we're hurting causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Again, we tend to think of me, not you, not this, me. We tend to think of me, what's God doing in me? I don't need you to become a good, mature believer in Yeshua, do I? According to Peter and Paul, yes, we do. According to Torah, yes, we do. You cannot live out Torah apart from a community. Which is, I think, the point Peter's making here to some extent. So we're to grow in the likeness of Messiah. We're not to stagnate. We're not to stop. We're not to just say, well, I've reached as far as I can. I'm going to sit down and be quiet now until time for me to go into uh, New Jerusalem. This is called sanctification. We're to grow up into him who's the head of the body of Messiah. What is our goal? Our goal is not to get in Jerusalem. Our goal is to be like Messiah. For that's wholeness and fullness of true life. He is the life. He is the life and the light of men. That's what life is. That's what light is. Being like Messiah. He alone is the standard of life for every believer. And so that's what we're supposed to be. is supposed to be like Yeshua. And so we need to come together. And the working of each individual part causing the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. All of us pulling together for that growing and, and our uh, desire to be like Yeshua. So our spiritual growth is through an ongoing desire for love and study of the Word of God. The Word of God for Peter is a living and enduring Word. 
A living and enduring word. That was last week's passage. We cannot detach the word from its author. You cannot detach the word of God from God who stands behind his word. And we cannot profess obedience to the Lord while neglecting or rejecting what he has given us. We can't reject any part of this word and say that we're uh, obeying, uh, being obedient to him in every way. So to love God means to love his word and to live his word. The one causing the growth is Adonai himself. We have the word presented by Peter, Paul, Moses, and the prophets did not, but God causes the growth. God causes the growth. Uh, God causes salvation. Uh, no, no preacher causes salvation. No evangelist causes salvation. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, convicts and converts. It is a work of God, not of, the, of man, lest any man should boast. And neither is our growth uh, something that I do on my own apart from God. It's because of our dependence upon God that we actually grow and mature in the things of our Lord. God causes the growth when that word's received and believed. But God causes that growth. God causes the transformation. Uh, another note here, because I thought this was uh, quite phenomenal, really. Peter's not concerned here about church growth in the numerical sense. Numerical sense. You know, I pick on Baptists because I was a Baptist, right? You know, you go into a Baptist church, you know exactly what they're uh, concerned about because they had it up on the wall. We had 150 in attendance. We took up this much money today. Uh, so we count ni nickels and noses. That's the way we used to say it, counting nickels and noses. How successful have you been? How many people are coming? How many people have you baptized? How much money have you raised? That's the idea of success. Not Peter's and not Yeshua's. That's the Baptist world. And he's not concerned about church growth in, in the numerical sense, but about the church, regardless of its numerical strength, uh, strength, becoming desirous about spiritual nourishment and spiritual growth. As John Stott uh, most of you probably are not familiar with John Stott. He was a, uh, still with us, I believe, but he is a uh, modern scholar uh, from Scotland. I said at the Lausanne Conference, we confess that we have sometimes pursued church growth at the expense of church depth and divorced evangelism from Christian nurture. That is a profound statement. We confess we have sometimes pursued church growth at the expense of church depth. And have divorced evangelism from Christian nurture. In other words, uh, we get people saved, but we don't grow them into the likeness of our Savior. And he says this leads not to church growth, but stunning the growth of the church. We got a lot of people, and they don't know much about the Lord. And that's where the church is at today, at large. The modern Western church is mostly anemic because of a lack of true Bible study and true discipleship. Get them saved, get them in church. And then they use the old adage they get from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, that is, whatever passage you're preaching from, make a beeline to the cross and tell people how to be saved. I'm sorry. Sometimes we have to tell people how to grow. We have to grow those who have been saved. Yeshua didn't say go save the world. He said go make disciples of all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit and Teaching them to observe all the things that I've told you. Discipleship. So on the one hand, you have evangelicals who focus on getting people saved but don't deal with a real ongoing discipleship. And on the other hand, you have meaningless studies that hold to one part of the scripture denying the other portion upon which it was based. Uh, we're just a New Testament church. We don't need that Old Testament stuff. And so what's really needed today is to build ourselves up on a most holy faith for the times are becoming more and more demanding of a faith that is real and genuine and not afraid. We will have to become willing to stand up for the truth no matter what the consequences may be. We need real spiritual growth through the understanding of the living word of God to get there. Well, let's go on to verse 3. If you've tasted the kindness of the Lord, long have that desire for the pure milk of the word. If so be you've tasted the kindness of the Lord. What a powerful idea this is. What causes desire the word, the taste? It's a metaphor. We should seek after the pure milk of the word because it tastes good. We've tasted when we heard the gospel message of Messiah, placed our faith in him, was born again. This initial taste of what it means to be saved should continue to unite us to the ever-living word of God. The word of God is sweet to our taste, nourishment unto our spiritual lives. And 
We could go so many places about that idea. I took the word of God. I took this scroll and I ate it. It was sweet to my taste. But here in Psalm 34, verse 8, Oh, taste and see that Adonai is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste. God uses the senses of a normal human being to try to get this idea into us. Sights, sounds, smells, and hearing. Five senses. He uses all of them. Oh, taste and see that God is good. So we'll move on to living as a people of God being built up as a spiritual house. And so we taste the kindness of the Lord. It makes us hungry for more. It's kind of like a bag of laid potato chips. You can't eat just one. So when you start seeing the truth of the word of God, it should drive you to see more and more and more. We come to the uh, other passage here, verse 5, and coming unto him as a living stone, or le- verse 4, I'm sorry, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua the Messiah. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but those who disbelieve the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very corner and a stone for stumbling and a rock of offense for they stumbled because they're disobedient to the word and to this doom. They were also appointed. So the focus here in Peter, as with uh, Israel throughout the Tanakh, is concerning a corporate unity. I want to make sure that we understand that as we tear down these little verses a bit. Uh, Again, we have a tremendous concern in America with individuals. I'm individually a priest of God. I'm individually, I have this priesthood of the believer. That's not what this says. Never has this said this. That's a modern Western mindset. I can be a priest. Why? Because I'm saved. Sorry, that's not what this means. Uh, Particularly true in our modern state of America, you're no better off with the far right uh, or the far left in either camp, you're all wrong, and they're all right. Individualism, individualism at its worst. Only those who fully agree are allowed to be part. Well, I can't get away from that idea. I'm sorry. Peter begins with coming to him. Coming to Messiah as a living stone. Now we change the metaphor. We were talking about milk. Now we're talking about a rock. Coming to him as a living stone. So it reminds us the call of Messiah to come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 1128 coming unto him as to a living stone so coming regularly translates the word karav in hebrew in the septuagint uh, to draw near in order to offer a sacrifice drawing near come unto him as a living stone and so the form of the greek word indicates we're not simply to come one time we're to keep on coming we're to live our lives with the ongoing drawing near of our lives to him as a living sacrifice which is in agreement with Romans 12, 1 and 2, which Paul says, coming unto him, keep coming to him as a living stone, a foundation stone, a cornerstone. And so we keep on drawing to Yeshua for he alone is the source of our salvation. We keep drawing near to him because he's the source of our ongoing life. We keep drawing near to him because he's the source of that future that we hope for and hold dear to. And he is the source. We don't draw near to religion for salvation. We don't even draw near to the Torah for salvation or to a synagogue, but the Yeshua to find salvation and growth. Now, surely we should find Yeshua in the Torah. Surely we should find the Torah and Yeshua in the synagogue. Truly we should find it in a congregation, but we don't always. We do find it in Yeshua. And then with our joining together, as a corporate body, each of us in the same state of affairs, longing for the sincere milk, drawing near unto Messiah as that living stone, uh, falling upon that stone, falling upon it in sacrifice, self-giving to make the body of Messiah be what it's supposed to be. How do we do that as a corporate body? Because each of us are doing it together in a unified manner. We do it at home, we do it alone, we do it here. Because that's our life. 
And so our metaphor shifts from milk to a stone. The Greek word here is lithos. Now, I think this is very important. We understand this lithos, which means a worked stone. And so they tell us when they were building that first temple, Solomon's temple, they, they had a quarry a long ways away from where the temple was because they were not supposed to hear the sound of the saws. How did they do that? You can find scripture that indicates they were cutting stones with a sword. How did they do that? Nobody knows. Nobody's found an ancient method of doing that, but they cut stones. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. They cut stones somewhere a long ways away, and they brought them there. They marked them. They brought them there for that temple to be built. And when they put them together one upon another, they didn't need, need mortar between them. They were so tight. And they cut those stones in some manner. I've seen a lot of ideas of how they did it, but they did it. And so lithos, a work stone, a cut stone for a special purpose, for building, for jewel, jewelry. Uh, it's like taking a diamond and cutting it just to fit that particular setting that you like for your wife or for yourself. In this case, Peter does not mention cornerstone or foundation stone, simply refers to Messiah as a living stone. But Peter refers to the stone rejected by men, and then he's going to quote this idea of cornerstone in fact we have three verses he's quoting from and there's a reference to the idea of both a corner and a capstone and there's a difference we need to understand the difference so peter uh, refers to this stone rejected by men so peter does not refer to messiah's name for him that's the word petros he's not talking about himself he's not referring to what he's going to do he's not referring to what he's going to create but whether rather to what god's doing in messiah because we use the word lithos, not petros. Petros means a little stone. It means like going down the road and finding a rock you're going to skip across the water. That's a petros. The Aramaic form Petra means like that city of Petra. You go to Petra, you've got buildings hewn out of solid rock. Uh, Petra, that's the rock, the foundation stone upon which the temple was built. A large bluff, a large section of just pure rock. Upon which you can build. So a stone cliff or mountain. A bedrock of a given location. On Yeshua can build his ecclesia. So let's listen carefully to what he says in Matthew 16. 17 and 18. And what Peter uh, exchanged with Yeshua was. And Yeshua said to him. Blessed are you Simon Barjona. Son of uh, Barjona. Son of Jonah. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter. You are Petros. And upon this rock, I think referring to himself, you're Peter, but upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia. Upon myself, upon, this is the foundation stone. Yeshua is the foundation stone. He's the cornerstone, right? So why would he build it on a little pebble? I say to you, you're Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell will not overpower what I build. What he builds, what he grows, what he develops. The gates of hell cannot prevail against that. So have we let him build us to a point that the gates of hell cannot prevail against us? Just a question. If Messiah is the living stone and he will build his ecclesia, as I prefer to refer to the church, the Messianic community of faith, then he alone is the head of that body. He is the head, he is the builder, he's the one who makes us to become what we see, uh, need to be. Only Yeshua can accomplish divine forgiveness and redemption for those who are saved. He is both the cornerstone and the master builder of the building. Now, the spiritual house he intends all of us to become. And now Peter's going to quote from Isaiah 28, 16, and Psalm 118, 22, and Isaiah 8, 14. Or is it Jeremiah? I'm sorry. Since these believers are likely to become like, since the believers are to become like Messiah, they're then depicted as living stones. We come to a living stone that we might become living stones. Like Messiah. We build this building. And so mostly this idea of a living stone is opposed to the pagan temples that worship dead idols. Well, sure, it's in opposition to the dead idols. Uh, and so it's an Isaiah that says, well, they, they have eyes and they cannot see. They have hands that they cannot reach. They have feet, they cannot walk. They have ears, but they cannot hear. Dumb, dead idols is the idea. But idols have no breath in them. They cannot speak, hear, walk, nor act. Neither do those who practice those false religions have any real life in themselves either. 
However, as we've been studying on Jeremiah on Friday nights, we came to understand that if in Jerusalem at the time of Jeremiah, the worship of God itself was quite dead. Because the leadership was quite dead. They were no longer growing. They were no longer doing the things of God. They were no longer letting the word of God transform them. They were going after the false religions. They were like those dead religions they went after. The worship of that temple was also dead in the time of Yeshua as evidenced by the destruction of that temple in the, by the Romans in AD 70. So the religion was dead before the Babylonians destroyed the first temple. Their religion was basically dead at the time that Yeshua walked this earth and it was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. The living stone, however, speaks to its life-giving nature. Yeshua is the author of life and gives life to all who believe. However, he was rejected by men. The stone that was rejected by men is seen, first of all, in the Jewish religious uh, leadership and even in his earthly family, who, to begin with, didn't believe and trust in him. There's a place in, I think it's Corinthians, that would indicate one of the first people he appeared to after his death, burial, and resurrection was his half-brother James. They gave us the book of James. Interesting. And most people suggest that all of his family came to believe in him, not just his mom only, but all the brothers. And his arraignment before Pilate, the religious leaders were able to incite the mob to cry out with them for crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And they did. Since that time, he's been rejected by the vast majority of mankind whenever they hear the gospel message. However, he's the means chosen by God to bring real life to all of mankind. Chosen and precious. Sets up for the following quotes. Chosen and precious, this uh, uh, cornerstone, this stone, this living stone. The word precious means to be honored, to be of great value, to have a unique status. All, of course, is true of Yeshua. Since Messiah is a living stone, all who come to him become like him as living stones for the building up of the body of Messiah, the Messianic community of faith. That's what our job is. That's what our role is. And so we have, first of all, my own relationship to the Lord. We have, second of all, our relationship to our unique family. And thirdly, of all, our building up this greater sense of family, this Messianic community. And all has to be ongoing at the same time. It's a metaphor of a building that's referred to the believers being joined together through Messiah to one another. And so we're a building. Uh, what makes up the ecclesia? What makes up the congregation? Even the Jews would tell you that the synagogue is the people. The word synagogue simply means gather together. The word ecclesia means to gather together. So if they didn't have this building anymore and we all gathered out there in that parking lot, guess what? We're still the body. We're still the building of Messiah. It is not dependent upon uh, earthen, metal, wood. It is dependent upon you and I united together as believers in a messianic community of faith. And so the metaphor of the building is referring to the believers being joined together in a spiritual manner. We, in fact, have several images utilized in these verses to impact our minds with a kind of unity that Adonai intends to create in the community of faith. I'm going to run out of time, I believe. A spiritual house, a holy priesthood, an elect nation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, which we're not going to get to verses 9 and 10. We're not probably going to get through verse 8. The first picture in our text indicates that we as living stones made alive from sin are continuously being built up into a spiritual house. So coming to the living stone, you as living stones are built up into a spiritual house. And that spiritual house is a spiritual house whether we got a building on the corner of Main and whatever other road or we don't have the building at all. We're still that spiritual house. It is a present and continuous reality. It's Messiah that does the building. We've already noted that. Uh, we're used as building blocks joined to one another. So as that spiritual house, we will function as a community of faith with or without the local building in place in which to meet. It will be true day by day in the marketplace, in our homes, and wherever we're found at any given time. We're joined to one another. We love one another. We care about one another. We reach out to one another. We help, and we do what we need to for one another. You don't have to have a building for that. The temple in Jerusalem was often referred to as the house of God. In the Old Testament scriptures, the Tanakh, Israel was to be the household of God where you could find God at work. So that when he refers to them as a kingdom of priests, 
He was referring to them as a nation gathered. A kingdom of priests. He referred to them as a nation gathered with God in the midst of them. And they functioned much like a priest because God was revealed through his presence in the midst of them gathered together. And so the household of God, you find God at work in the house. We would find uh, we would limit sacrifices that to not to the temple. We would not limit such sacrifices in the time without the temple. The sacrifice of laying down my life for my brother, my sister, my immediate family, my uh, ecclesia family, my community of faith. The living sacrifices of giving ourselves daily Messiah to follow after him. Our praise, our words, our deeds, that which we give over to Messiah's service and through all of this, such sacrifice and our love for one another as Messiah has loved us. We need to understand Israel was described as this kingdom of priests to identify God being made manifest in them together as a nation. It's not as though every single Jew as an individual functioned as a priest. He was in the sense of unity, identification and cohesion that God revealed himself in the way that they lived out their lives in relationship to one another. If you read the Torah and you read Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy says, when they see the way you live, when they see you keeping this Torah, when they see the way that you care for one another and the way that my Torah will tell you to do so, they're going to see that there's a God unique to you. And want him. And that's the way you and I have a priesthood of the believer. To see God at work in us as a community. It would include a real expression of love for one another. The nations uh, around Israel would see that they themselves lacked and needed. And the same is true today of the body of believers. So Peter then goes to quote from um, in verse 6 from Isaiah 28 16. Followed by. Uh, Psalm 118 verse 22 and then Isaiah 8 14 all of which relate to Yeshua as the stone the stone described then as the cornerstone a stone of stumbling a rock of offense and quite frankly a capstone as well two different depictions of a special stone in scripture the cornerstone the capstone so the features of a cornerstone is that it's visible and everything else must line up with that corner to keep this structure straight and strong my brother was a good carpenter. I'm a sorry one. I build stuff, but it, it looks straight as my brother's. So to build something straight, you need a square, you need a level, and you need a plumb bob. You want to know that it's straight from top to bottom, straight from side to side, straight corners where things come together. And so what keeps that structure straight was the cornerstone. Everything else has to meet that cornerstone. So one of the unique features of the capstone, it was cut first and placed last. Some identify that as cornerstone. Well, no, the cornerstone is the corner. Everything comes around and meets that corner. And so what we're told is in those ancient days, they would, they would have a plan laid out. You'd have an architectural plan laid out. They would cut all these stones. And if you put every stone in the place like it was supposed to be, starting with the cornerstone, ending with the capstone, when it came to that capstone, you would just slide it into place and wouldn't even need mortar. So perfectly it would fit. And if it didn't fit, you did it wrong. Yeshua was cornerstone or capstone. Because when Yeshua came, God basically looked at the temple. He looked at the people of Israel and he said, he doesn't fit, tear it down. And he did. And he began fresh with people, both Jew and Gentile, to build a building of Messiah. A body of Messiah. And so he tore it down. In a real sense, Messiah showed up. The religious leaders of the day looked at him and determined Yeshua didn't fit the design they were building. And so they rejected him. What really uh, this means is they didn't build it right. They didn't interpret the scriptures correctly as to recognize him when he came. Or it means that they did know who he was and said, no, we won't control and got rid of him. Well, all three to some level is true. Some they had their preconceived notions of what Messiah was going to be like and do. And so he didn't fit their ideology. And so they rejected this guy and said, he can't be the guy I'm looking for. And others understood, quite frankly, who he was and decided we won't control. Get rid of him and it will be ours. And God said, well, he didn't fit. So I'm tearing it down, literally. Instead of building fresh and new, they rejected him because they want him to be in control 
They want to be in control of the people rather than the Lord. And I give you this passage in Matthew 21. I don't want to take time to read it because we're running out of time. Uh, but he gives us this parable about the vine growers. And he follows the, the story about the vine growers with this passage. Did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from Adonai and it's marvelous in our eyes. Did you not know this? Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will be given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. So he's taking these same uh, quotes that Peter's using and it, then he's given us a little commentary. And it's going to crush. Isaiah 28, 16, uh, to give you the whole verse here, thus, uh, therefore thus says Adonai, God, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone. A, just what we're reading in Peter, a tested stone, a cut stone, a prepared stone. A costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. What does that mean exactly? Well, the last word we want to give a bit of attention above in the NASB, it was translated disappointed. Here in Isaiah, it's translated in the Old Testament as disturbed. Literally, it means not be put to shame. He who believes in it will not be put to shame. He who believes in Yeshua, the cornerstone, the foundation stone, the capstone, will not be ashamed, be put to shame. Solomon's temple, the second temple, were both destroyed. What This is affirming that what Messiah builds will never be destroyed. What Messiah builds in us, the community he builds through us, will never be destroyed. We're going to go on into glory as he comes for us. As living stones laid upon the corner so that we will not be moved. We are to be built up in faith and with our continual daily being fashioned together by Messiah through the work of the Ruach HaKodesh, the word of God, uh, into his people who will stand the test of this world and his evil generation. We're being built up by Messiah, through the word, by the spirit, in order that we might stand the test of the world and this evil generation and not go away from this. Verse 7, this precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve. There's a contrast between those who are real and genuine and those who are not. A contrast to belief and disbelief, obedience and disobedience, Stumbling is brought about by disobedience to the word and the spirit. One's not being built upon the corner uh, stone in faith. And so Yeshua's commentary that we looked at has to do with those who stumble over Yeshua and are broken into pieces in a stone which they fall upon unbelievers and scatters them like dust. Dr. Fruchtenbaum suggests this is a reference to the structure of the second temple in AD 70. You got a lot of different ideas out there. Well, I think it does, but that's not the full picture. It'd be hard not to run to Daniel chapter 2, which is what I did. I ran to Daniel chapter 2, and it's what Daniel 2 says. In the days of those kings, and he has this huge statue that he's seen, head of gold. You got gold and silver and bronze and iron and clay mixed together at the feet. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And as much as you saw a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, out of the mountain without hands, our God is a rock, a rock of refuge, an ever-present help in time of distress. Yeshua is a rock. He is the stone. He is the foundation stone. He is the capstone. And throughout the word of God, we'll find God is our rock. Yeshua is our rock. And what is this rock, this stone cut out of a mountain made without hands except Yeshua? That's Yeshua. What mountain? Are we talking about Mount Moriah? Or are we talking about the mountain of God? Mountain of God. Well, that is Mount Moriah on this earth. And there's a mountain in heaven, so to speak. And that's where he comes from. So this stone... Cut out from the solid rock without hands. It, it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. It crushed the kingdoms of the earth. The great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. And so this rock of offense, this stone, is going to crush. When he comes to reign over this earth as king of kings and lord of lords, he's going to crush the other kingdoms who have rebelled and turned away and disbelieve and don't follow after him. So in light of this, we have two choices before us. 
in light of this passage. Very strong passage, it seems to me. Believe and go on being built up as a spiritual people, joined to one another by being joined to the cornerstone, or as unbelievers destined to be crushed, to be judged, to suffer eternal death in the lake of fire. There is a doom for those who do not receive Yeshua. And so what will, must we do? Look, keep on longing for the sincere milk of the word. Keep on studying this word, relying on the Holy Spirit, being built up as a building of people. When he says he's going to build his ecclesia, he doesn't mean this structure over us. He means the people who are joined together as one in this community of faith. And he builds communities because the best way to see that God's real and God's alive is to see how people love one another and care for one another and just serve. And sometimes, you know, you don't even have to open your mouth. Ronald was giving care to a, a Jewish family uh, doing the home dialysis down in uh, West Palm Beach. Very wealthy family. And uh, she would go in there, Messianic, had a uh, Jewish star on her uh, necklace at the time. Never said a word. Never made any big deal about it. She just went in there and, and cared for that family. And cared for that family. Cared not only for the man who was having dialysis, but also for his wife. And just cared for them and just lovingly, tenderly did her job and, and cared for them. And after several weeks, uh, this woman, this wife said, can you tell me a little bit about this Yeshua you believe in? <laughs> just because she loved them and was there. And that's what they're going to see is our love for one another and even for them. That'll make a difference in someone's life. Well, we're out of time, and I'm at the end, so we'll end with that note and see what questions or comments you might have today. I know I should have stopped probably about three verses ago. Hot and heavy today. Anybody? All right, I try to bring it down to where we lived today a few times because it's quite stressful to me. Some of the things we see going on in our country. Uh, we see it in some of the camps. These camps, the far right, the far left, they encompass politics, they encompass churches, they encompass people, they encompass all kinds of organizations. And what we need is uh, to love and accept each other and build up this congregation to be what it's supposed to be. That's what God called me to do. That's what I'm trying to do. I need to do a better job, but this is what we're, what we're here for. It doesn't matter how big it is. It matters how deep it is, how strong it is. God is more concerned about getting a group of people that are serious about studying about him, serious about him, and less serious about all the other things that uh, are the accoutrements that bother so many big churches, mega churches. Don't matter to God. What matters to God are people that are sold out for Yeshua and living for him and giving him the glory. Great things he has done. Always. So y'all are being very quiet. I better, uh, we'll close because I'll just keep on rambling if I don't. Let's stand. Even Adonai Adonai Vayishmareka Yair Adonai Panavaleka Vikuneka Yis Adonai Panavaleka by a similar car. Shalom. May Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Adonai lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Vashim Yeshua HaMashiach Sar Shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. And Shabbat Shalom.